Okay, everybody, let me welcome you to this um, European Politics in Transition uh, webinar um, on work, family, fatherland, social populism in Central and Eastern Europe. I'm Jonathan Zeitlin. I'm the academic director of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies. Uh, which is uh, organizing this event jointly with um, SPAL, Five and Twinter. Um, I'm very happy to welcome uh, tonight uh, two old friends uh, and authorities on the subject. Uh, first, uh, Mitchell Orenstein. Uh, he's professor of Russian and East European Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's written pretty widely on issues of uh, economic policy reform, the political economy of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and Russia's uh, hybrid war on the West. Uh, his most recent book is uh, The Lands in Between Russia and the West, uh, Russia versus the West and the New Politics of Hybrid War from Oxford University Press in 2019 in uh, Boyan Bugaric. Uh, is professor of law at the University of Sheffield, and he's written very widely on constitutional law, comparative constitutional law, public law, EU law, uh, democracy, uh, development, and also uh, new governance. He has a new book coming out with Mark Tushnet called Power to the People, Constitutionalism in the Age of Populism, uh, that's going to be published by Oxford University Press uh, later this year. Uh, and I'm also very happy that we have uh, the, uh, the organizer of ACES's um, European Politics in Transition uh, series, my colleague uh, Sara Delanga, uh, who is the, um, holds the, uh, the Dane Owl uh, Chair in the Political Science Department. Uh, at the University of Amsterdam, and she is very much an authority on comparative populism, uh, party systems, with a particular focus uh, on Western Europe, and she will be the discussant. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons I was so uh, eager to organize tonight's event is it, it brings together two uh, exceptionally interesting themes. Uh, we hear a great deal about the challenges of rule of law and democratic backsliding uh, in East Central Europe, especially in Hungary and Poland, but we hear very little about some of the uh, policies, especially social policies, which have made uh, the populist uh, governments and parties in those countries uh, popular with a significant part of the, uh, of the population. Uh, and we also don't spend much time uh, comparing the populist uh, parties um, in East Central Europe with their counterparts uh, in Western Europe and North America, some of whom have also uh, developed um, social policies uh, aimed at uh, protecting elements of the, uh, the welfare state uh, for the native population, sometimes called welfare chauvinism. So we're gonna bring these two themes together. The format is going to be that uh, first uh, Mitchell and then uh, Boyan are going to speak for about 30 to 40 minutes. They're going to present uh, a paper with uh, some slides at the beginning. Then Sarah will comment for about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, then I will give um, the two speakers a chance to react briefly uh, to Sarah's comments, and then we'll open up to Q&A from you, the audience. And if you look at the bottom of your window, you'll find uh, a, a Q&A button. You can post your questions, and I will select from them, uh, read them out, and direct them uh, to the speakers and the discussant. And you can start uh, doing that uh, at any time during the, um, the presentation. So without further ado, uh, let me give the floor or the Zoom screen uh, to Mitchell Orenstein. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, 
Thank you, Professor Zeitlin. It's it's wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, I couldn't be more pleased, except if I could be there uh, to, uh, together with you in person in Amsterdam would give me even more pleasure um, than right now. Uh, I have to share with you this uh, paper that I have uh, written with my colleague, uh, Boyan Bugaric. Uh, I'm going to share the slides with you right now. Uh, um, there appears to be some, uh, some background noise I'm hearing on the presentation. It sounds like a hallway or something like that. So if uh, somebody has a background and would mind muting themselves, that would be terrific. Um, thank you. Um, this is a, uh, what, what I'm, what, the org- you, Mr. President. Um, my oh, sorry, that's me. Dean Never mind. Detail, okay, uh, this is, you'll have to forgive me. I think it's my own computer, which is causing this noise. Um, oops. Okay, I think it went away. All right. Um, so, I, this is a paper that um, Boyan Bugaric and I um, published in, uh, in the um, Journal of European Public Policy, JEP. And what I'm going to do in this presentation is run through our argument very, very quickly, um, quicker than, uh, than would be uh, typical for me, because so, I tend to be long-winded, because I, I want to give time for my colleague, uh, Boyan Bugaric, to talk about some of the implications, political implications of our research and also for questions and answers from this uh, distinguished group. Um, the title of the paper is Work, Family, Fatherland, the Political Economy of Populism in Central and Eastern Europe. And I should preface by saying that Boyan Bogaric and I have worked together and been studying the region for quite a number of years now, uh, going back to the 1990s. And uh, it's been a pleasure to work with him on this, on this paper. So in essence, what I will do right now is to present very briefly um, the political economy theory of populism that we present in the paper, which sort of asks a why, how, and when of uh, populist economic policies. We're going to describe the new populist economic approach very briefly that took shape after 2008. And then, as I mentioned, uh, Professor Bugaric will, will speak about some of the interesting implications for European politics. So the political economy of populism, um, as a lot of, a lot of people acknowledge in the literature on populism, I was reading Professor DeLong's work about this, mentions, begins with the same comment, that populism is seen as a thin centered ideology that, uh, that essentially um, it, it's a, a sort of against the elites for the people, but it doesn't really have that much in terms of content and therefore can be combined with lots of different ideologies or changed over time uh, in order to respond to certain, certain circumstances. And so our argument in this paper is that um, the definition of populism in Central and East Europe has thickened recently to include an economic dimension, uh, beginning with Hungary and Poland, but also diffusing to other Central and East European countries such as Serbia. The rise of populism, of course, has uh, multiple causes. Um, in the broader literature on populism, these causes are seen to be largely cultural in character or economic in character. Cultural is a reaction to globalization or immigration. Economic is a reaction to neoliberalism or increasing wealth concentration in elites. Um, and we argue at the beginning that in Central and Eastern Europe, there are reasons to think that these economic causes may be even more important than the cultural causes because Central and East European countries have lacked immigration that has affected other more developed countries and also had much more radical economic reform after, the, after 1989. So that somewhat justifies our, our focus in this paper on the economic dimension um, of populism in the region. We argue in the paper that um, the global financial crisis of 2008 was a very important turning point for populist, pol populist economic policies. Prior to 2008, populist parties in the region, this starting in 89 after the transition to capitalism, uh, 
and up to 2008, populist parties in, the, in Central and Eastern Europe generally went along with neoliberal economic reforms. Generally speaking, when populists were included in government, they would have the education ministry or some other ministry, but not the, um, the finance ministry who typically was filled by a liberal politician. And, and you could see in their programs as well, populist parties going along with these type of reforms. But 2008 had a very substantial impact on Central and Eastern Europe. In particular, it caused a sudden stop, what is called in, in uh, a massive flow of foreign investment had been reaching Eastern Europe during the 2000s. And that flow suddenly stopped in 2008, causing a very swift decline in growth rates in the region and recessions in, in most of the countries in the region. After 2008, we see that uh, after this sudden stop, the populist parties are the first off the bus uh, in moving away from neoliberal policies, not always entirely, there's a big debate in the literature about how far they've gone to move away from neoliberal policies, but in any case to develop a, a distinct sort of approach to economic policy that on the one hand is uh, nationalist in character, mixing a kind of nationalist vision of economic policy and sort of economic developmentalism, a kind of conservative developmentalism, authoritarian uh, governance style, uh, mixed with a kind of welfare chauvinism that would target deserving domestic populations and prevent uh, immigrants in particular from getting the benefits of, uh, of social welfare policies. And I would know, and, and so that all is combined with a kind of um, independence or sovereignty narrative, uh, protection of traditional families. Um, and we, we, I would point out that this is not just our idea. This, we're, we're depending actually in this paper on a, a very vast literature that's actually emerging right now. When I was looking through the references of our paper, I saw that maybe half of those references are from 2019 and 2020. So there's a big interest in what's going on in Hungary and Poland in particular, um, and showing that there is a sort of, and trying to label the distinct approach and interpret it in different ways. Uh, that we rely on very, very heavily. Uh, it's clear in this literature that Hungary and Poland have led the way, and I'll give a very brief overview of what they've been doing that appears to be divergent uh, in a way from neoliberal policies. In Hungary, there was an effort to shift income to the household sector and away from foreign enterprises. Um, that basically sought to decrease the tax burden on households in Hungary and increase, introduce some new taxes on foreign enterprises that were very controversial and were adjudicated within the EU institutions, uh, taxes on financial, large financial corporations and also retail corporations that ultimately passed various tests and have been implemented in Hungary. Um, there was also a huge effort by the uh, Orban government to provide jobs for the unemployed. These all things happened after 2010 when the Orban government took power in Hungary. Uh, there was an emphasis in welfare, which Hungary always had a fairly substantial welfare state, uh, but there was a new emphasis on targeting traditional family structures, traditional families and uh, encouraging fertility uh, as well as encouraging jobs. Uh, you know, to try and create, to start, try and fight immigration by creating more Hungarians. That was the kind of slogan that Orban deployed to explain that. Um, and it's important to point out that there were still subsidies for some foreign corporations in Hungary, but primarily those that were producing many, many high paying jobs, particularly German car manufacturers. Poland, um, uh, you know, after the uh, the populist government took power, began it indicated that it was inspired by Hungary, indicated that it was uh, following Hungary to some degree, but also set off in its own direction. It it promoted a it, it uh, implemented a family 500 plus program that really eliminated youth poverty by providing direct payments to families providing subsidies for people to invest in school equipment, which they'd previously borrowed in bank loans to pay for, as well as other aspects of a middle-class lifestyle, such as vacations and just, uh, you know, I suppose, uh, food and other, other things. Uh, in addition, the government has, and, and I would point out that that Family 500 Plus was the most expensive policy um, 
that uh, had been implemented in welfare, I believe throughout the entire region and um, since 1989 and was vigorously opposed by liberals in government or in opposition at the time. Um, the, uh, the, the Polish government also sought to restrict junk contracts and employment, short-term contracts, eliminate taxation on youth to avoid out-migration, again, a sort of nationalist vision here of people staying at home. And you can see in recent days that one element of this or related element of this is women's rights are under attack in particular abortion rights. Um, and so to sum up neatly this sort of range of policies, we argue that, that um, the old Vichy government slogan actually fits quite well, work, family, fatherland. That this is about um, encouraging work whereas neoliberalism had diminished employment in East Europe to put, to put people back to work whereas families were under pressure to sort of uh, rescue traditional families and uh, give them more support and all encapsulated in a kind of nationalist vision. So that's the reason for the, top, the, the chat, uh, title of our article. Um, I'm going to just very briefly state, and we can talk about any of this more in questions and answers, but these we also show, and this is a step I think a little further than some of the articles that we cite in our, in our paper, that we show that there's considerable evidence that of diffusion of these ideas, that this is not just Hungary and Poland, this is actually contemporaneously diffusing to other countries. And in particular, we, uh, we use the case of Serbia. Um, Serbia, I, I actually, because it's a, uh, a nationalist, also a nationalist populist government, it's outside the European Union, which is interesting. Um, but we see that uh, President Vucic in his inauguration address in 2017 picked up this language of work and family and nation. Of course, he's seen as a nationalist. Uh, let us create jobs because jobs create us, make children and then give everybody a chance for more jobs and even more children. I, th I think that's a charming statement of this uh, approach. Um, and he's followed it up, of course, with certain acts uh, such as the creation of a new ministry of family care and demography in 2020, which is meant to carry forward the um, uh, uh, carry forward a, a policy which is similar to the family 500 plus a sort of subsidy program for uh, traditional family well for families uh, with children and um, we can also talk in the discussion I think the discussion will bring this up about analogous policies in Western Europe we do see some analogous policies like the rise of welfare chauvinism among West European populist parties, uh, Professor Zeitlin mentioned that in his introductory remarks. Uh, we've seen the rebranding of uh, uh, the Austrian FPO party to serve the common man, to sort of move away from more extremist messages towards a more populist economic message. We don't go into depth on this topic. I, I, that would be interesting further research, how much these countries might be influenced by developments in Hungary and Poland. And we don't have a clear you know, answer to that, but just would note that it does seem that this is just beyond these two cases. And importantly, I wanna end here for our, um, for our theoretical argument in the paper, we argue that the, um, we, we provide a sort of economic or sort of a, I don't know, a, a, a theoretical elaboration about the economic basis on which populist parties are making these um, decisions. Well, well, populist parties um, initially um, used neoliberal economic or accorded with neoliberal economic policies to signal their positive investment climate to the West. That's the argument of my book with Hillary Apple from 2018, from Triumph to Crisis, in which we argue that um, that populist parties, among others, went along with. Um, uh, neoliberal plans, basically in the hope that they would attract, you know, economic growth through foreign direct investment. And that was a key priority of economic policy throughout the region until 2008. Um, the populist economic policies we've seen after 2008 have relied to some extent on Eastern investment, investment by authoritarian regimes. Um, so in particular, we see some interesting examples of Chinese funding for Hungary. You may know that after the, uh, the CEU left Hungary, the, that um, a new Chinese university has come to kind of take its place. Um, and Poland was one of the first, I think the first European countries to issue debt in uh, Chinese uh, markets. 
Uh, Russian energy deals are another feature, Serbia, uh, Hungary in particular, uh, less so in Poland, I suspect. And also UAE has made huge investment, large investments in Serbia in particular, a major uh, development in the center of Belgrade, kind of rebuilding the city, the capital city. And it's a prestige project very closely associated with the president Vucic. And we, along with other scholars, would argue that um, that this diversification of investment has allowed, enabled populist governments to balance the Western pressure for economic policies that accord with what the West wants, and to enact a kind of more independent alternative political economy argument. Not, not so much that these countries are joining the East rather than the West. I mean, the Hungary and Poland are members of the EU, but rather that um, that having the participation of these authoritarian governments from abroad enables them to reduce their reliance overall on uh, the European Union and provides a kind of um, a cover or sort of independence uh, for them, room for maneuver for them to implement a, a sort of different form of economic policy than might be seen in, in other European countries. So with that, I'm going to end, I hope relatively on time, and uh, invite uh, Professor Bugaric to speak about some of the implications um, of this and some of the reasons that we were interested in this topic. Thanks. Thank you, Mitchell. Um, thank you. Professor Zeitlin and uh, others for this invitation. It's great to be with you. So I'll briefly focus on three broader claims, which I think uh, try to uh, will try to explicate the things which are mentioned in the piece, but we haven't spent that much time as with the um, political economy theory of why these populists uh, have become so popular in, in Central and Eastern Europe. The first one is uh, linked with what Professor Zeitlin mentioned at the beginning, when we hear about populists in Central and Eastern Europe, we mostly hear stories about, you know, their problems with rule of law, with violations of, you know, with their problems with constitutionalism, with their courts being captured by the, you know, the populist parties, by their, uh, you know, other independent institutions being basically uh, dominated by the executive branch of the government by serious problems with respect for human rights and, and things like that. So, uh, and we hear much less about the social policies which make these populists uh, widely popular in, in, in their respective countries. And uh, our uh, article was uh, in a way in an attempt to criticize um, a more usual general traditional approach to populism, very popular nowadays, not the only one, but very popular you know, by very prominent authors such as Jan Werner Müller and others who basically argue that, you know, that there is a, such a thing as a general, uh, you know, populism, which has some general characteristics, mostly, you know, that they are, you know, populists are in general anti-pluralist, they are anti-democratic, anti-liberal and so on, um, with which we do not necessarily disagree, but we want to show that there is much more, you know, to populism than this kind of general characteristic. That populism comes in many colors, in many manifestations, and it is very important to understand the social, legal, political context of these different forms of populism. And for Central and Eastern Europe, the one interesting thing is that yes, it is true they are, uh, you know they are semi-authoritarians, but they also do some things which are widely popular with the population. And um, uh, it is important to acknowledge that. It's important to understand the po political economic roots of their popularity. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's very difficult to try to imagine the alternative policies, which uh, uh, we kind of signal in the article. We don't deal with that uh, much, but, you know, uh, just focusing on their, you know, illiberalism, you know, it's it's which is mostly the, the moment the way how most how our liberal friends are treating them uh, doesn't get us very far. So unless we understand the popularity, it's very difficult to devise alternative, different strategies to try to, you know, challenge them, you know, on, on the on the political ground. So that's the first sort of part of kind of a connection with the with the more general debate on populism. Um, uh, the second one 
is, you know, to acknowledge, as I already mentioned, that, you know, they do certain things well, you know, they enact good policies which contribute to general welfare. They might not be optim optimist, they might optimistic, uh, optimal, sorry, they might not be, you know, the best, you know, kind of policies, but as uh, Mitchell presented, you know, they are very far from, you know, uh, uh, what is usually, you know, the, the general account, especially by economists, that you know all these social policies. This is, you know, kind of helicopter money being thrown at the population, very badly invested, and so on. Uh, we try to show that that's not necessarily the case. So then, um, the second point, so taking that into account and acknowledging that, we also have to look at the the other aspect, which is, you know, more widely known about the, the case that they are part of the broader package. So yes, so they do these, you know, interesting social policies, um, you know, couched in, in, in the authoritarian nationalistic language, but they also, uh, you know, undermine rule of law. They also, you know, they are semi-authoritarian. Some would call them authoritarian. I mean, there is a quite a huge difference between Poland and Hungary also, we have to say, because we can, and I, I here, you know, this is kind of, you know, me, constitutional scholar speaking, there are very important differences. Although they follow very similar script, uh, the popular word is uh, in, in the literature is a sort of you know authoritarian uh, playbook. So they usually start with the constitutional courts. That was the first target. So they capture the courts because constitutional courts in the region are very very important because they are one of the most powerful veto gates institutions that can block, prevent, you know, the, the populist parties to enact their own legislation. And that actually exactly what happened in the previous uh, peace incarnation in 2005, 2007, when the Polish Constitutional Tribunal invalidated some of the key uh, parts of legislation of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, peace uh, government from that period. So the government really wanted to make sure that this time that would not happen again. And they were extremely successful in less than a year in both countries. Uh, you know, the constitutional courts were packed. Uh, the legislation was changed. Their jurisdiction of the courts was curtailed. It was more easy to do that in Hungary where the Orban enjoys two thirds majority in, in the parliament. So it, Orban can change any law, can change constitution whenever he wants. In Poland, that was much more complicated and much more difficult because they don't have enjoy a similar majority. Um, so this um, uh, broader package, which which basically means uh, authoritarianism, illiberalism, is usually uh, not very well dealt with in, in also in the general literature on populism. If you read many different accounts, we find very few which try to distinguish between two broader families. Uh, for example, Tipa Norris was one of the first in his uh, widely acclaimed good book on uh, Trump and Brexit and authoritarian populism to distinguish between authoritarian populism on one hand and you know social liberal versions on the other hand. So that's, that's uh, I think, another important uh, uh, link or contribution that we have to be uh, aware when we, when we think about uh, different populists around the world. And uh, the most, I think, one of the most difficult questions is how to uh, navigate between these two different faces, if you want, of populism in, in, in this part of the world. So on one hand, they apparently do some good things for their citizens, their population, but on the other hand, you know, they are authoritarian. They are exclusive. You know, they exclude many other people. They enact laws which are, you know, not only anti-liberal but sometimes you know very discriminatory. You know, in Hungary, they were able to push. You know, probably the best university in the region, Central European University, out of the country, which is probably you know the first time in the history after World War II you know, that something like that happened in in in, in Europe. Uh, you know, they enacted laws which went after you know you know certain you know human rights, more particular against NGOs and so on and so on. Uh, as I mentioned, they went after media and many other stuff. So they both follow this sort of authoritarian playbook. But in the end, there are also important differences between the two countries. Uh, when we talk about this more negative aspect about their sort of, uh, uh, as I said, authoritarian, uh, no, illiberal package, which is which is sort of a, a broader uh, platform which they which they pursue in their policies. And um, and uh, I think the interesting thing to say here is that also there are important differences. 
which are usually not acknowledged in the in, in the literature because most of the accounts try almost you know to uh, 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 generalize and say that Poland and Hungary you know are kind of you know part of the similar story. But I would argue that you know even though they borrow from a similar script, the situation is importantly different. Um, there's a sort of a strong agreement in, in you know in, in, in constitutional law scholars that you know Hungary the situation in Hungary at the moment democracy is more or less temporarily lost whereas in Poland that's not the case you know, Poland has much richer tradition of you know social movements uh, dating back to solidarity and further back uh, and uh, there is much more uh, a fight, uh, you know, from the opposition and, and so on. So we haven't crossed the Rubicon yet in Poland. So there is a, still an open question whether Poland will end up where Hungary is currently at the moment. Um, I could go more in detail about this legal institutional aspect, but I would rather leave that for the second part for the debate if there are questions about that. But I just wanted to highlight the point so that there, we have sort of a com built in complexity on one hand. Uh, populists would do good things, but also on the other hand, they, uh, you know, pursue policies which are part of this sort of, a, you know, general nationalistic exclusive uh, uh, sort of authoritarian, authoritarian paradigm. And um, um, the, the, the next point is, you know, what are more sort of a normative general conclusions and which is also related to the possible comparisons with, so what are we to make out of this case? So um, what is the possible appeal of this populism? As, as Mitchell mentioned, we briefly deal with that at the end of the article. We, we, that's not really sort of a part of the, uh, of the article. Uh, you know, we, we don't do th with that exclusively. Here it's mostly me speaking you know, from the book that I just finished. I allow, uh, uh, forgive me for, for you know, a little bit you know, self-promotion here, but uh, uh, from there, uh, it, it, it seems obvious to me that uh, there's a potential huge uh, 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 space here for you know for for spillover effects and for 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 uh, you know uh, possibility of uh, uh, transportation of this model to other parts of the world. And when we wrote this piece with Mitchell, we were thinking actually about certain comparisons, and uh, two candidates were on the table at that time, but only partial candidates because they try to make a similar sort of a, which is, you know, uh, tour, they, they try to go left socially and right culturally and, 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 and so on. And that was uh, uh, Trump and, and, and Boris Johnson. But then uh, with, you know, now with Trump gone and Boris Johnson uh, not really promising his uh, leveling up agenda, we didn't want them to include that part and that comparison into the article because we thought it's too early, too premature. But we could clearly see in sort of a very general outlines a similar attempt. There are many authors actually in England today could think that Johnson is generally speaking trying to uh, go along some similar path. So basically trying to keep you know more uh, uh, you know the, the the traditional conservative uh, you know uh, nationalistic. Uh, 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 supporters, you know, uh, uh, as part of the project, but also moving into a completely, you know, different, more socially uh, friendly agenda. And, and, and his leveling up approach is, is, is a good example of that. Whether that's a, a sincere, a real attempt, or just a rhetorical uh, uh, electoral promise, we'll see. It's probably too early to tell. Um, and, there, and there's also more general critique of, of this comparison, which kind of claims that basically and calls the, 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 the other two examples, the, the, the American and the British, as a plutocratic populist. There's an excellent book out by uh, Pearson, uh, Let Them Eat Their Tweets, which coined the word plutocratic populism. Basically, they say, unlike Eastern European populists, Trump and, and also they don't talk about Johnson, they mentioned it in passing. They just promised rhetorically some improvement in social policies for the workers. You know, you know Trumps. You remember his. You know, he went to. You know, uh, you know to. You know, you know, you know. In, in, he did that. You know, in, in swing states. You know, he promised to bring back the auto car industry and, and, and things like that. But he didn't do much in, you know, in order to implement. Whether Eastern European populists really implemented quite significant chunks of social policy, which changed drastically the lives of their people. 
And uh, the last line, so is then the um, um, more kind of a kind of more a question than 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 a, than a claim or assertion. And it was made by 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 author. I haven't been able to directly locate the the, the quote, but the author actually one of the prominent authors on populism, claiming that um, there there are certain advantages, you know. Which are built in in this kind of you know interesting uh, blend of different policies in Eastern European approach because according to him it's easier for the right to move left socially than it is for the left to move right culturally. So that's why you know he claims that this kind of a populism will have has and will have a sort of kind of potential appeal in also other jurisdiction in other countries around the world. Um, so. But as I said, the last two points were more kind of speculation. They are not really dealt very well in the article, but are also part of the broader thinking that I'm uh, engaged in, in in my other work. So Mitchell might probably disagree with me on these points, but I'm completely open for discussion here. Thank you. So thanks, uh, Boyan and Mitchell, for this uh, fascinating and um, insightful presentation also. Uh, provocative. Uh, I mean, my own sense is actually the uh, the turn of populist parties, at least in Western Europe, in a socially left but culturally and politically right direction is not at all new. It has been happening country by country steadily since the mid to late 1990s. Uh, I'm very interested to hear what our expert on comparative populism uh, my colleague Sarah DeLange will have to say about that, and I turn over to her now. Thanks, uh, Sarah. You have uh, the uh, the screen, so to speak. Thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction, and thank you, Professors Orenstein and Bugaric, for a wonderful presentation. I think it's great that you've taken the research into populism in Central and Eastern Europe a step further, but by not focusing only um, it's a liberal nature and democratic backsliding, but bringing political economy into the equation and looking at the macroeconomic drivers of uh, populist success, but also especially of populist uh, sustainability. So how can populist movements stay in power over prolonged periods of time? And what I particularly like about the paper is that it combines national developments uh, of a political economic nature with international developments. Uh, and I think what you show very neatly in the paper is how the interaction between global developments, such, such as increasing uh, economic possibility eastwards of the Central Eastern European countries, coincide with more national and EU level developments that at the same time drive these movements in that direction. Uh, now, of course, my, my place here today is not only to praise the paper and its research, but also to come up with some uh, points for discussion. Uh, I'll start out by making some comments about the paper itself and its focus on Central and Eastern Europe. And then I'll also move on towards a comparison between Central and Eastern Europe and, and Western Europe. So to start with, uh, for your paper itself and this idea of social populism enabling populist movements, especially in Poland, uh, Hungary and Serbia, uh, to, to be long-term ruling forces. Um, what struck me about that uh, idea is something that uh, Professor Ornstein also mentioned in his presentation, that it was clear that there was an electoral niche uh, for this kind of, of policies, but that, as he said, populist parties were the first off the bus. So once the uh, socioeconomic crisis or the, the financial economic crisis of 2008 affected the countries, it was the populist parties that first recognized the opportunity that was presented to them to move away from neoliberal policies and to embrace social populism. Now, one of the questions that I still have after reading the paper is, why were they the first ones to be off the bus? Was it that this ideological shift was most compatible with their existing ideology? Was it that their populism enabled them to embrace this new socialist agenda? 
was it that they were uh, best able to sense what was required in terms of having the best connections to the electorate and sensing most clearly what the dissatisfaction with the, of the population was? Or were there maybe also some political strategic elements that came into play? Um, if we look at it from the, the scholarship on political parties, we know that political parties are most likely to change their course and to embrace new policy avenues. Um, if they have, for example, experienced serious electoral losses or if they've lost uh, the, uh, their incumbency status. Now, of course, in the Polish case, um, the change in orientation came directly after the loss of the 2007 elections. So there, the latter argument might apply, but perhaps it doesn't in the case of Hungary, for example. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about why it was specifically the populist parties and not other political movements that saw this opportunity that emerged in 2008. Second, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the role of EU level politics. Uh, you mentioned it to the extent that you explained that neoliberalism was enforced by the EU, right? It was a precondition for accession. And as a result, most political movements in uh, Central and Eastern Europe had no other choice than to embrace it in the period around accession. But what you don't discuss to great lengths is the extent to which the neoliberalism promoted by the EU came under pressure at the time of the financial economic crisis. So could it also be the case that the fact that neoliberalism within the EU became contested also in Western Europe? I mean, there was a lot of criticism, of course, of austerity policy and of the idea of balanced budgets. Could it be that this contestation created room for parties in Central and Eastern Europe to move away from the neoliberalism uh, they were forced to uh, embrace uh, prior to that. And then the third thing I would like to, to ask you, uh, and this is really something where I don't know the answer, I've been very curious of your opinion. So you primarily focus on, on macroeconomic uh, developments in your paper. But there is, seems to be an argument that these macroeconomic developments, rising unemployment, uh, increasing costs as a result of the financial economic crisis, that these fed into micro level considerations of voters and hence uh, the support for populist parties. Um, so that there is, you know, a economic or even sociological motive behind the support for these parties. But there also seems to be an implicit argument in uh, your paper, and I'm, I'm wondering if I, I observed this correctly, so I would very much like to hear your ID, that there is also an element of political socialization that comes into play. That uh, large generations in Central and Eastern Europe have been socialized under communism, therefore have certain expectations of the state in terms of social policies. Uh, and that those expectations were not met in the period that neoliberalism was enforced by the EU. Uh, but once the opportunity arised, that uh, political parties sought to uh, meet those demands. Now, if that is the case, if there is also an element of political socialization, is it then the case that we see large generational differences? And what does this mean for the future? Right, if we see increasing number of generations that are not socialized under communism, but were socialized actually in the period in which the EU enforced neoliberalism, do we then see, can we then expect other demands for, for newer generations in that respect? And might that shift the support for populist parties? You know, not maybe in the next two, three years, but on the long term. So these were my three main comments with respect to your paper itself. Then in terms of the comparison with, with Western Europe. Um, so I really like the title of the paper because I think it connects very well to the agenda of populist radical right parties in, in Western Europe. So home, um, family, fatherland, home is the, uh, the uh, populism, the heimat, um, family is the authoritarianism, the traditional way of thinking about society and fatherland is the nativism. Um, 
So if that's the case, um, if this is a combination of populism, authoritarian and nativism, uh, are you then observing something in Central and Eastern Europe that particularly pertains to the populist radical right or to populism more generally? And I think that question is particularly important if we also look at Western Europe, because 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 there we, of course, see a lot of more left wing or centrist populist parties. Um, and my idea would be on the, on the basis of the reading of the scholarship about Western Europe, that what you're observing is actually not social populism, but is, is a very particular uh, socioeconomic program that belongs to populist radical right parties. So a subgroup of populist parties. These are the parties that look at uh, socioeconomic questions from a perspective of, um, of ordinary hardworking citizens versus lazy and corrupt elites. So that's the populism that look at um, socioeconomic questions from the perspective of deserving and undeserving citizens. So deserving citizens obeying to the traditional demands and structures of society and social parasites not obeying to these uh, principles. I think, for example, of people who've all their lives been uh, on benefits, have never worked, uh, people that cannot work because they're addicted, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, looking at socioeconomic uh, questions from the perspective of natives versus non-natives and differentiating between the social rights of these two groups. Um, if we look at it from that perspective, so from, from what you observe as social policies, really as a populist radical right phenomenon, um, then where does migration come into the equation as a macroeconomic factor? So if we look at Western Europe, we observe that most of these populist radical right parties have quite, let's say, left-wing social, poli so, so, social policies in the sense that they are in favor of a strong welfare state that supports hardworking native citizens. Um, but if we look at their more financial economic policies, they're actually quite right wing in the sense that they're in favor of lower taxes, limited regulation of businesses, uh, relatively small state, etc. And the, they reconcile these two positions by saying that they can have both, they can have low taxes and high social spending by reducing the cost of immigration. But of course, immigration is a different uh, macroeconomic factor in, in Central and Eastern Europe than in Western Europe, simply because of the, the volume of migration that takes place. So if it's not true migration as a macroeconomic principle, then how do Central and East European uh, populist parties reconcile this, this, uh, this equation? Um, just a, a last question I have uh, also in terms of the comparison between Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, Professor Bugaric also spoke of the uh, democratic backsliding that's taking place uh, in Central and East Eastern Europe um, and the different facets that it has. And I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit more on um, the relationship between that authoritarianism that is at the root of this democratic backsliding and these social policies. So to what extent should we understand these social policies as sort of paying off citizens to accept the democratic backsliding that's taking place, right? Is there a relationship between these two? Are these social policies necessary in a way to get away with the democratic backsliding? and to curtail the, the freedoms of citizens and, and con put constraints on the rule of law. Uh, I think the answer to that question is also important to understand what kinds of risks liberal democracy in Western Europe is uh, running in this respect. So I'll leave it at that because I think I've spent my time, uh, but I would be very interested in hearing your responses. Oh. Thank you, Sarah. You've raised uh, quite a lot of issues uh, for discussion, uh, both about um, uh, the populism in Central and Eastern Europe, 
and about the, uh, the characterization of what's going on in Western Europe and about the comparison between them. So I, I'm gonna give the, um, uh, the word to, uh, to Mitchell and Boyan very briefly. So I say take you know, maybe two minutes each. We already have a couple of questions in the chat, rather in the Q&A. And so I encourage uh, other listeners uh, to, uh, to send us your questions uh, through the chat. And I have a few questions of my own that I'll bring in at some point. Um, so Mitchell, you, you seem like you'd like to start. Please yeah, go. let me just start by saying thank you for your comments, uh, First of Delang. This is, uh, you know, we have, I can see from your questions, we have more areas of agreement and we would be in tune on a lot of different issues, whether you're talking about, you know, the macroeconomic factors, you know, that fed into some of this stuff, the, the obvious discreditation of neoliberalism within the EU, the fact that the EU pushed neoliberalization on this region and then sort of backed off all pays attention. Let me just focus if trying to be very brief on a couple areas that, that are interesting where we don't have maybe great answers right now, but I could hope to try to answer some of the questions. Um, I think that, um, you know, um, Mm, you know, the, the, the reason that these parties were the first off the bus, I think, had to do with two basic reasons. One is that they were never really happy to be on the bus in the first place, right? So populist parties and movements in Central and Eastern Europe were always suspicious of Brussels. This is where I feel like I, I'm somebody who's, who's based my career a lot on field work. We were talking with Boyan about this last night, but you know, one of the insights you get from that is you go to meetings. You know, I've been to meetings of these populist groupings in the 1990s in Poland, and you know, one of the things that most stood out to me at that time is they they were already talking about we don't want to trade subservience to Moscow for subservience to Brussels. That was always a slogan of the populist right in Poland, right? And uh, so I think that um, they interpreted the sort of, you know, EU and Western neoliberal strategy as something that was non-nationalistic. It was, it was subservience. And so they were, they had a lot of reasons to be the first off their bus. Um, but also I think you're right that there was just, you know, an opportunism there that um, they saw that they could pick up on this. And I think this goes to the last set of questions you ask about, you know, is there a trade-off? It's an interesting way to pose that question. Is there a trade-off somehow between the populist sort of generous social policies and very ungenerous, you know, power sharing policies, right? Ungenerous democratic backsliding, right? And so you could po you posit that there could be people who are angry about democratic backsliding who are who are like, well, as long as I get fed, then I'm fine, you know, with that. And I, I think that's very insightful. I my my the way that I would approach that is a little bit different. Just to say that you know. I think the way to look at it is that um, their, their um, conservative social policies by and large in all of these countries are unpopular. They're unpopular. So for instance, this, um, this anti-abortion thing that's happened you know, in Poland again, right? A new law that's been passed, people are protesting, does not have majority support, it has minority support. Right. So there are conservative parties that are that are very committed to a very unpopular social agenda and they need to have some sort of positive agenda that can allow them to win a majority. And that positive agenda is basically social policy. So in a way, I think you're right. It's sort of what they're trying to find is is people. Maybe they're they're sort of middling you know, on, on socialist or liberal conservative or liberal sort of social dimension, um, but they're willing to sort of you know, support a party that is finally delivering some economic goods for you know the middle classes essentially. Um, so you know that goes to the, another question I'd like to respond to, which is about the question of is this populism? So populism, as you know, is a broad category that that encompasses many many different things. And frankly, the literature on populism in, in Europe and the United States is sort of marked by kind of over broadness, you know, use of this term, right? And and we contribute to that, I think, to some extent, um, in part because that's what the debate's about and people are using the word. But there are a lot of people in the literature who are arguing that this phenomenon, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, could be described by other better words, um, conservative 
conservatism, right? This is just a revival. Is that's kind of what we indicate with the work family fatherland. This is a revival of a European conservative tradition, which is monarchist, you know, non-democratic, you know, pro-family, you know, pro-church, right? All those sorts of things that traditional European conservatives were about before the rise of democracy, and. Um, and so, you know, I think that they may be right about that. I, 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 we use that term also in the, in the paper. Um, you know, we use the term, pop, and, and another way to, to talk about it is, as you do, populist radical right. This is about the populist radical right. It's not so much about the left populism. Um, so th those are just, you know, indications, but by and large, I, I found your comments really insightful and, you know, we could have a longer discussion about the nuances of these things, but we have the same, you know, questions and issues, I think, that you you raise um, very fairly. So thank you. Thanks, uh, Mitchell. Uh, Boyan, do you want to come in? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be very brief. So thank you, Sarah. This was all fascinating questions, really great questions, very stimulating questions. And I just wanted to add a few uh, thoughts of my own. Uh, for example, to the first one, um, I, and I think I, we mentioned that actually in the article, I think it's very important to remember that one of the important reasons why they were, you know, among the first, you know, there was, you know, has to do with the weakness of the social Democrats, you know, who, who are the major exponents of, you know, neoliberalism as promoted also by Brussels. And there's a great work on this question being done by Sherry Berman and some others who basically uh, provide more general answer that the, the you know the because you know if, if you look around the world we see that you know we talk about populism but what we actually see is a much more stronger prominence of right wing populism you know there are very few successful example of left wing populism and the argument by Sherry Berman and some others is that that has to do with the weakness you know of social democrats in many different countries and I think that was we made that case briefly in the introduction about how. You know, social democrats in both countries, uh, you know, failed. You know, around 2008 and 2009, uh, quite miserably, actually. Uh, the second, also very important point, when you move to the comparison between the Eastern European populist and the Western European, you mentioned uh, that Western European populists, unlike Eastern European, more traditionally, try to remain more liberal when it comes to their economic policies. I would say that yes and no. There have been some important shifts here. For example, if you look. For example, the Austrian and the Danish case, you know, they're the, the both parties, you know, the FPO and the Danish Democrats try to reinvent themselves as a parties of the, you know, the working class. In Austria, it was the first time after World War II that, you know, a vast majority of the, you know, working class, you know, moved from, you know, socialist to FPO, you know, in the election a couple of years ago. So there was, there's something going on which also is moving I'm not saying all, but some of the Western European populists into a similar direction. Um, on the um, uh, uh, generational issue, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and your question where, you know, do we get, you know, political socialization, you know, and the potential different responses of different generation. And you're seeing this in, you know, in, in, in basically, in, you know, the, all, all other countries, you know, look at the Brexit, you know, the huge educational, you know, and generational divide, you know, all, if you ask my student in my classroom, 99, 99.9%, .9 they oppose Brexit, you know, older people, pensioners, they support Brexit. It's not the only divide, but it's a very important divide. So, which also, you know, uh, opens the question, how sustainable is this? As you indicated in your, I mean, I felt that that was sort of a subtext of your question. So if that's the case, you know, we might be talking, you know, about something very provisional, something that might not survive. I don't know, next electoral cycle. Quite possible, you know, quite possible. But I want to just add another thing. That's one, you know, we, we I think we, the one thing we try to make clear in the article, maybe we don't spend enough time, is that you try to resist this kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, a single factor explanation of populism, which is pretty much present in political science literature. So it's either, it's either econ economy or it's culture. So you have to find sort of a single out, a single important. I think it's much more complicated and for my taste we don't talk about it the best um, you know work that I found which tries to move beyond that is it's actually not by political economy but but it's by uh, economist Danny Roderick from from uh, Harvard he, he he talks about how uh, you know cultural and economics you know 
uh, uh, circularly, you know, affects, you know, and how they produce the different variations around the world. So thank you, Boyan. Sarah, I'm not going to let you respond now, but I will give you a chance to respond. Uh, for the moment, we have three um, substantive questions unanswered in the, the Q&A, and I will uh, read them out individually and direct them to different people. One, at least, as I would say, as much, if not more, for Sarah as for the others. And then I have a few uh, questions or comments uh, of my own, and then we can bring the three of you back into, into dialogue. Uh, with the, each other. So the first um, question that I wanted to, uh, to present is from Petra Guasti. And she asks, I think the, uh, the two paper givers to elaborate on the extent to which the Central and East European populace reacted to the failure of the economic liberals and the decline of social democratic parties, which of course in the CEAE context were mostly uh, former communist uh, parties that, um, uh, you know, uh, developed new, reskinned themselves or rebranded themselves. So uh, which of you uh, would like to take that, Mitchell, Boyan? I, I honestly, I think Boyan kind of answered that question just a second ago, right, when he remarked about Professor Berman's work and uh, Maria Snegovaya, others who've been arguing that exactly that point, which we agree with, that you know the um, that it's the decline of these social democratic left parties that that created a um, an opportunity for them, and it, and the reason that they declined was exactly because of their embrace of neoliberalism, right? So the 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 center left, you know, strongly embraced neoliberal economic policies. Um, the former communist parties strongly embraced neoliberal policies after 1989. Um, basically, I think this is my personal pet theory. I, maybe Professor DeLong will appreciate this. I think it was because they thought that anchoring uh, their countries in the European Union through a vigorous you know, embrace of what the, you wanted them to do, which is to liberalize, would prevent the emergence of fascism eventually in their country or some sort of authoritarian takeover in their country, right? So they had to hold tight to Brussels as a sort of uh, hedge against some future right wing, you know, or foreign, you know, sort of takeover. They never really said that, but that's just my, my impression of it all. Um, but for whatever reason, I, I agree entirely with Boyan here that, you know, it was, um, the failure, the, the, the embrace of these very unpopular neoliberal policies ultimately by social democrats, which led people to not trust the social democrats. And, and by the way, accessory to that, also not, not improving social welfare very much, right? Being associated with a lot of cuts, you know, rather than, you know, development. So um, that, that I think is absolutely clear, yeah. Can I just add one, Jonathan, just one sentence yeah. here, one yeah. detail, we also, very interesting and important for this question uh, that Petra asked. Uh, Hungary was the first country to be bailed out by IMF before all, you know, the Greece and Spain and others uh, in 2009. So I think that's, that, that's a very, very important thing, which partially also explained, you know, explained the question. Okay, thank you. Um, so now well, we have a couple of questions which have been partly addressed um, by Mitchell in the written chat, but maybe it's still worth yeah. uh, talking about them. So someone, uh, and I'm, I apologize since I, I, I can't, um, I don't know your, your full name, but someone writing under the, um, uh, the, the name F. Kutzer um, asks, um, you know, basically weren't there people who predicted, um, you know, much earlier that uh, countries like Hungary and Poland would evolve into autocratic and nationalistic uh, governed uh, nations. And the, uh, the, the quote is attributed to Andre Amalric, who was also the author of Will the Soviet Union Survive Until 1984? I don't know the, the context in which he made the, uh, the prediction, but I mean, to what extent 
um, you know, do you think that, that the turn um, that Hungary and Poland have made is a, is a surprise? You link it very much to also the, um, uh, you know, to the impact of the, the global financial crisis. And um, I mean, Sarah mentioned in her comments, um, you know, that parties often swing when they've had a major defeat. And of course, not only uh, law and justice in Poland, but also um, Orban in Hungary was in office and was driven out of office. And uh, his current incarnation is, you know, the second and much more successful uh, bite at the cherry, so, so to speak. So maybe you can connect those two points. I mean, let me just start it. Maybe uh, Buen will also have his own perspective on it. My, my initial response is, you know, it's similar to my response to the previous question. Like, I think that left politicians in this region of the world were always very conscious of the Russian threat. They were always also very conscious of the nationalist populist threat within their countries because, you know, that, that's the lived history of the region, right? That's the history of the interwar period of authoritarian, you know, kind of conservative governments. And, and I don't think anybody on the left who is in a serious position of power really thought that those, those ghosts were totally defeated. They thought that they would come back at some point, which, which was the reason that they deeply embraced the EU and deeply embraced whatever it took to get there, including neoliberal policies, capitalism, etc. So I know for a fact, I, I happen to have been a, a, cl a close, well, I wouldn't say close, but a, an academic colleague of um, Jerzy Hausner, who was a pref professor at University of Krakow in the 1990s, who eventually, he was a very, very smart guy. I really appreciated speaking to him and spent a lot of time at conferences with him, drove around to meetings with him. And uh, he became prime minister of Poland, I believe in 1998, I'm not sure, no, maybe 2002 or something, anyway. But he, um, he, he later became a, an important figure in government. Uh, he, had, he wrote a book in 1992 making a similar prediction, right? So it, it wasn't that people didn't think that there could be a populist um, you know, reaction. Jeffrey Sachs also thought there was gonna be a leftist reaction to neoliberalism, right? So people were aware of that. I think what's, what's really surprising to me, and this is really you know, the 2018 book I mentioned before that you know, is the key theme of that book is why this didn't happen earlier, right? Sachs thought that this reaction would happen in the mid nineties. Why did it last until 2008 before anybody decided that neoliberalism was not a good idea, which by the way, had been unpopular. Most of the history, political history of East Europe you know, during this period is like one government comes to power offering neoliberal policies. They're defeated by another government who says, we're gonna not do neoliberal policies, but does neoliberal policies anyway. They're defeated by another government that uh, says that they're too corrupt and they're not gonna do neoliberal policies, but they do neoliberal policies. And in fact, there's never until 2008, any government who actually comes to power in these countries that goes away from neoliberalism. And so you see voters during that time being increasingly upset about this and, and willing to vote for increasingly, I think, extremist parties. Um, so, um, so, you know, I think the real question is not, you know, why was there a populist wave, but, you know, as we tried to answer in the presentation in the paper, why did it not happen until 2008? Like, what, what was it about 2008 that changed things? And now all of a sudden you see these, these kind of populist economic policies. You know, I, I, before I turn to the next question, I can't resist one question of my own. I mean, as a student of the EU, I'm a bit skeptical about how neoliberal the EU was vis-a-vis -vis East Central Europe um, before uh, 2010. I mean, if we, you know, what's striking about, um, you know, civic uh, platform um, is the, the extent to which, you know, let's say they were more, you know, neoliberal than the EU asked them to be. Um, and the same was true about Orban in his first incarnation uh, in power. And we could, you know, the, the reaction against uh, Gurchani in, uh, in Hungary, the social democratic uh, prime minister who Orban uh, defeated was much more about um, economic competence and uh, lying to the, the public about um, 
the, the, the financial situation of the government uh, prior to an election and being caught admitting that he had lied. So I, I wonder you know, how much of this is really uh, about um, the EU imposing neoliberalism and how much it was about the you know, autonomous um, social and economic strategies of uh, these governments, which for their own reasons, didn't want to use what possible uh, space might have been available uh, for more, more progressive uh, social and economic policies. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll, I'll answer it because it's again, the key related to the key thesis of this, my 2018 book with um, Hillary Apple. You know, so there are two answers I would give for us as I lend to that, which is one is that for most people, I, I agree with you, and I think we've discussed this at conferences, you know, and in your work, you, you, you show this very clearly, I believe, on labor policy, that there are different views within the EU. There's a more pro-neoliberal view, and there's a more pro-social view, and a lot of times the policies in the EU are kind of a mix of these views in some respect or another, right? Uh, and, you know, but I would argue that it's very important to recognize overall as an overall thing that when it came to East Central Europe, the EU was always solidly on the neoliberal side and did very, very little to uh, support a pro-social transition, okay? So even despite it's internally being more mod modified or more, you know, uh, more of a consensus view in its relation to, again, these external initially partners, right, in the transition, in the accession process, it, it's definitely enforced neoliberalism in general. Now, I would just start, I would say that started with 1990. I'll just say one word, FARA, you know, the Poland-Hungary assistance to reconstruct whatever it was, the FARA program, which was the essential economic, it was the, the most, one of the most important instruments for providing economic aid to Eastern Europe by the EU, which presented quite a lot of aid. And uh, it was contingent on exactly the same Washington consensus policies that um, were put forward by the IMF. There was no distance at all, actually, in, those, in, the, in the 1990s or later between the Washington consensus at the World Bank or IMF and what the EU was, was pushing and advocating in this region. So that's an area where, where East Europeans, I think are rather sensitive about EU and, and where people maybe within the EU don't fully understand. Now, notwithstanding that, you're, you're right that, um, that there, were also, there were also dynamics going on within the region. And, and we also cover that in, in that book where, you know, um, I have an article on out liberalization, right, for the EU. So, I mean, there were also governments that came to power in Central and Eastern Europe that wanted to outdo the EU in liberalization. Remember, they were coming from a place where the EU was more liberal in its, in its economic policies than they were as socialist countries. And uh, they wanted to get to a level of liberalism that was higher than Germany or the UK even, right? And so there was a dynamic, you know, of, of governments trying to overcompensate, you can say, or outcompete the EU by being the most liberal countries within the EU, for instance. Um, and there was that dynamic that was pushed again by the right, uh, by liberals. And it was also to some extent pushed by the left in, in the region. So I guess I guess I agree with you that, that there are both of these things going on. There are two different dynamics. One is the EU forcing liberalization and the other is uh, certain governments at certain points of time in Eastern Europe wanting to liberalize more even than the EU had wished. I don't know, Boyan, if you had other things to add to that. Um, Just a slightly different take, which, you know, has to do with the fact that I'm not, you know, a political scientist, but in the constitutional scholar, there is also another take on the situation, you know, a complementary take, which also, you know, uh, went, you know, developed on the pages of journal democracy debate between Ivan Krastev and, uh, and the British political scientists, whether, you know, this development is a, a result of, you know, failures of, you know, the policy related, or is it something much deeper, more profound? And, you know, and the argument there being that, you know, we might be seeing something that has to do with, you know, with the legacy of the region. And that's why it might not be, you know, quite as possible in, in Western Europe. And, and the argument was that, you know, uh, 
despite the old, you know, the, the, the reforms and, you know, and the progress, you know, in institutional development, you know, the region still, you know, hasn't, you know, internalized, you know, the key values of rule of law and all these, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, elements into its own constitutional orders. In other words, you know, the, the roots of constitutional culture are much more shallower than in Western Europe. And then you can have even more pessimistic view, you know, which would say that, you know, there is a certain, you know, history, tradition, legacy, you know, in the region, which basically shows that, you know, there were cycles of this, you know, swings back and forth between, you know, this returns to this highly authoritarian, you know, Pilsudski in Poland, you know, and, 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 uh, uh, and um, you know, and Hungary, you know, has its own, you know, neo-fascist and so on. Most beautifully shown in the movie by Istvan Shabo. I don't know if you saw it, Sunshine, Zonenshine, which shows this history of these shifts. But I, I do not necessarily buy it. I've just mentioned that there is there that exists. Thank you. So um, there is a question from Ruben van den Bear, which um, I think um, is. Um, is more properly directed towards Sarah in the first instance, but I'll let uh, Mitchell and Boyan uh, come in afterwards if they want. So uh, Ruben asks, how do the speakers view the way the traditional center parties respond to the rise of, of populism? For example, the, uh, the Austrian uh, People's Party, the Christian Democrats, uh, have adopted many populist positions from uh, the F FPÖ, um, the um, uh, you know the, uh, the 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 Austrian Free Party, um, like welfare chauvinism, anti-immigration policies, general skepticism towards pluralism, and liberal positions. Will this absorb and neutralize these positions, or rather lead to a radicalization of the middle and an erosion? Of parliamentary and constitutional democracy, there's certainly, uh, you know, some uh, arguments uh, in, in many other countries besides uh, Austria that at least some traditional center-right parties have tried to steal uh, or borrow some of the clothes of right-wing uh, or radical right uh, populist parties. So, Sarah, do you want to uh, respond to that in the first instance? Yes, I, I think that the pattern that Ruben observes is absolutely correct. So there's a lot of research uh, these days that shows that center-right parties, but also center-left parties, tend to respond to the success of populist radical right parties by taking over some of their positions. Uh, it's been documented that this, that this happens when it comes to their immigration stances and their integration stances. It has been documented that this happens with respect to their um, Euroscepticism. And it's also been documented uh, by our colleague, uh, Gijs Schumacher, that this happens when it comes to their welfare chauvinism. So uh, part of the, the social populism that uh, Professor Orenstein and Bogaric uh, study. But it should be noted that welfare chauvinism um, is not an essential feature of all populist radical right parties uh, in Western Europe. So um, there's many populist radical right parties that have adopted welfare chauvinism and also other forms of populist social policies. Um, ranging from the Danish People's Party in Denmark um, to parties in Southern Europe. But there are also quite a number of populist radical right parties in Western Europe that continue to maintain a very neoliberal socioeconomic profile. And this goes, for example, for the Norwegian Progress Party, this goes for the Swiss People's Party. So wherever uh, populist radical right parties do embrace welfare chauvinism. This leads to co-optation of their positions, but when they don't, of course, this doesn't take place. Now, in the case of, of uh, immigration stances, for example, I think it's most clear that this can lead to an erosion of uh, uh, liberal democratic principles, right? So we've seen, for example, in the Dutch case, uh, we've seen the Liberal Party in the Netherlands, the VVD, advocate differential legislation for uh, migrants and non-migrants. 
in a similar way that the populist radical right parties sometimes do, uh, hence affecting the, the basic principle of equality for the law. Um, in other domains, this is less clear. So when it comes to the Euroscepticism, for example, the link is less prominent. If we look particularly uh, to the welfare chauvinism, I think this is a major concern. And I think Denmark is sort of the best example how this can translate into policymaking. Um, sit, people residing in, in Denmark uh, with an immigrant background have very high thresholds these days to um, have to meet very high thresholds in, a, in order to be able uh, to access all kinds of forms of, of uh, social support. Uh, which puts their position in society really at, at a different uh, level than that of uh, so-called native citizens. Uh, and I think this, this form of inequality is, uh, is, is, of a, is concerning. Thank you. Um, Mitchell or Boyan, do you, is there something you want to add? Um, just, so just, 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 just quickly to the, I think the question of Ruben's question is really great. And I, we just happened to, again, in, 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 in the book with Mark, uh, we have a short chapter on, uh, you know, Western European populism. Of course, we look there mostly at the, you know, the institutional constitutional features. And our answer to Ruben would be that no, despite the fact that, you know, the, 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 the People's Party moved, you know, to the right on many different issues, they, Act, they uh, acted as a buffer. They helped, you know, to prevent the, you know, the the, the FPO, you know, to implement many of their, you know, very problematic institutional reforms. So the liberal rule of law in Austria was pretty much intact after their one and a year half in power of the, you know, the centrist populist coalition. But you know, it's only one year and a half. So you know, who knows what would happen if they were in power, you know, longer. So thank you. So I have, I have two more questions. One is a quite specific question for Mitchell and, uh, and Boyan. Um, I mean, we talk quite a bit about the generational uh, differences uh, in, in these countries and how they might, uh, how they might be connected to po political socialization and political uh, experiences. But there's also uh, in both uh, Hungary and Poland, a very strong, um, regional dimension. So, um, I mean, support for the uh, law and justice is primarily, is, is much strongest in the eastern half of the country, with the exception of, of Warsaw. And uh, similarly, in, uh, in Hungary, there's a, a real cla cle you know, clash between uh, the cities and the small towns and the countryside. And so a question is, how do these issues of, um, you know, social policies, which are aimed at families, which are aimed at young people, which are aimed at, um, I would say, the, uh, the poor and the lower sections of the, of the middle class, uh, how, how does that fit with the, the regional uh, difference? Maybe I'll let you answer that because the next question would be, uh, one that Bert tries to bring Sarah in as well. Yeah, let me just say that I, I've been working on a new project um, together with my colleague Kristen Godsey that is looking at exactly these type of divisions, like demographic divisions, and sort of how that affects the the way that these uh, groups did during the transition, how well they did socioeconomically, um, and to some extent also politically. So first of all, you know, it's a great question. Um, absolutely, there are very big divisions. There's a huge urban rural divide in most of these countries. There's also a very big generational divide. In general, the right populists, I think in Poland and Hungary, it's fair to say, would be people, um, you know, would be stronger in the small urban areas and rural areas of the country and less strong in the capital cities, which have benefited the most from neoliberal developmentalism. Um, so that's one thing. Um, generationally, I think it's it's interesting. I think that um, that Professor Lang also had a question, which I failed to answer on that, which, you know, was about kind of, you know, how would you expect these generations to fall? Will one be more nationalistic than another? And you know, one of the things that's kind of interesting is if you look at um, 
I mean, the younger generation is definitely different. They're, they're more exposed to Western culture. They probably have, a, you know, on average, more sense of democratization, rule of law. They've been to Western Europe. They have more norms and culture that is basically similar to Western European. Um, on the other hand, um, it's maybe not a total, it's not an overwhelming, you know, um, support in all cases. So there are still young people who live in small rural areas, for instance. Um, the, the, one of the really interesting questions that we, we kind of got into is this question of uh, communist era nostalgia, right? So you'd expect that the people who are nostalgic for communism in Central and Eastern Europe, of which there are maybe 15 to 30% in different countries, um, would be primarily old people who lived under communism. And that's um, mostly true, but it's also true that there's a lot of nostalgia for communism among people who never grew up under communism. Um, it, which means that, that a, a lot of the political values have actually tr been transmitted from one generation to the next. Sometimes because uh, of grandparents, you know, who lived under communism transmitting values to the young. There's also the issue that, you know, that you see probably very strongly in the US and I suspect maybe you see it in East Europe as well. The young people grew up under neoliberalism and they may be the most, you know, strongest to react to neoliberalism <laughs> in a lot of ways, right? Because here in the US, um, people who have, you know, suffering under debt bondage, essentially they have like, you know, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 dollars of debt. Once they leave college, they tend to be more socialist, you know, in their attitudes than, uh, than others, right? So uh, I, I guess the, you know, the answer is, is a great question, but I don't know that we really have definitive answers to that, um, to those questions. You do see the populist you know, the policy is reaching out to young families. It's, it's reaching out to young people. And um, I, I suspect they could be successful in that, but you know, it's, it, there's certainly a lot of young people who are more cosmopolitan and just leave, you know, for that reason. So it, it's very hard to say. So here's my last question. It's a question for all three of you. Uh, and then I think we have to, uh, to wind up. I, and that is, I'm, you know, I think I, I, I agree with uh, Boyan that, um, you know, at the, while, as Sarah said, there are some uh, radical right populist parties that have remained um, more neoliberal in their policies, more and more of them, if we look over the 15 year arc from the mid 90s to today, have adopted um, various kinds of um, welfare chauvinist and pro-welfare state uh, policies. Uh, we can also think of the Front National or whatever it's called now uh, in France and even you know, the Flamme's Belang in, uh, in Belgium has moved in that direction. And yet none of those parties in the end have been as successful as uh, Orban in Hungary and um, uh, law and justice in Poland. I mean, at, at most, they have been briefly in government or they have um, been able to influence government from the outside, like the Danish People's Party. So what is the, the explanation? Is it to do with the, uh, the socioeconomic situation, which is different in Central and Eastern Europe from Western Europe? Uh, is it to do with the, uh, the structure of party systems, uh, the weaker constitutional uh, protections against an authoritarian trend that uh, Boyan uh, mentioned. Um, I mean, first of all, is the claim fair? Sarah might want to uh, dispute that. And secondly, if it's true, what explains it? So um, actually maybe I give Sarah the, uh, the word and then uh, let, um, Mitchell and, and Boyan have the, the last words. Sarah? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think your observation is, is correct. So what we see in Western Europe is that populist radical right <coughs> parties, uh, irrespective of whether they have a more welfare chauvinist program or a more neoliberal one, uh, 
uh, poll uh, usually not above 30% of the vote. So th that seems to be sort of the, the ceiling uh, in most countries uh, around that percentage. Um, and as a result are always uh, forced to govern with mainstream parties if they're invited to join government coalitions. Um, I think there, there might be a couple of reasons uh, of different nature um, that, go, that explain this difference between Western Europe and Central and Eastern Europe. Of course, one has to do with party system institutionalization. So the party systems in Central and Eastern Europe are simply less stable or, or have been less stable for a very long time. And, and voters were more used to switching frequently between parties than in, in Western Europe. Um, in Western Europe, we still have uh, substantial groups of voters who have been socialized into voting for the existing party system because it has been so stable over the last uh, 50, 60 decades, uh, five to six decades, apologies. Um, I think another reason also has to do with turnouts. Um, so generally speaking, turnouts in most West European countries is still uh, substantially higher than in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so votes are distributed in a different way over the existing parties. Um, and I think that might have to do something with it as well. Okay, thanks. I think I'll give uh, Boyan the word and then Mitchell, you can have the, the final word. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad you've been answering some of the questions in the chat that I have not had a chance to bring, bring forward. Uh, Boyan. Yeah, I, I think this is, you know, this is one of the, the most difficult question, actually. And I don't think that there is a simple answer to it. I think it's a, a little bit of everything. So, for example, my own, you know, as a non-political scientist, the way I see it is, you know, it's a combination of many, you know, things that you mentioned, Jonathan, in a particular context, in a particular way. So it was the weakness of the left. You know? It was the, you know, the, the, the weak institutionalization of many constitutional norms in that region as well. Uh, you know, it was, you know, the fact that, you know, the economic crisis, you know, was stronger, you know, in the East than in the West in that part. So it's it's really hard to single one. one. I mean, I've, I've seen authors who are trying to do that, but I don't think I'm not persuaded by, you know, the, the, the one of the last attempts was by Stephen Holmes and even Craster, the light that failed. And they spent the whole book talking about, you know, the failure of imitation. So I, I don't find it quite pervasive, pervasive. So I would I would tend to believe that it's a combination of the different factors, which were mentioned also by Sarah earlier. And how exactly they play out is, you know, is a matter of a good, you know, contextual, socio-legal, you know, analysis in the particular country. Thank you. Okay, Mitchell. Uh, you know, I, I just point out, um, you know, a couple points. I mean, agreeing with most of what has been said that, um, you know, in Poland, for instance, you know, the, I guess one question why they were more successful in Poland, what you could broadly consider the Catholic um, conservative right, okay, um, party in politics, which was always a different party. They always coalesced around a different grouping. I mean, there were numerous parties, the AWS, various others. They were always one third of the vote approximately in Poland, right? Somebody who held the banner of, you know, sort of sovereignism, nationalism, et cetera. And the, the, the thing that was di different about the Kaczynski, you know, was that basically they found a way to get a majority or not really a majority, but a, a bigger plurality of the vote. So they ended up with, I think, between 40 and 43% of the vote. And so this paper is really about the, the extra 10%, right? Because, you know, the the 30% who were already anti-abortion, they were already, you know, part kind of anti-democratic, definitely pro-church hierarchy, you know, pro-conservative values, wanted to see every poll going to church every week, right? They were already 33%. What they needed was that extra 10%, right? That got them a majority in the government. And that's the story about the social policies is that there was a group of people in the middle who didn't, care much about the conservative agenda, but wanted better you know, economic policies. And those people got uh, taken away from the left, uh, from the social, you know, from the post-communist left, they got taken away from the liberals. And, um, and that's made up the, so I think when you think about, you know, uh, 
um, France is the only country, I guess, where you could say that the those that, that sort of pretty far right, you know, already, you know, had even close to that, right? So I guess that does speak a little bit to Bland's point earlier that this is about deeper cultural traditions, right? There is definitely a culture as in everywhere in Europe of conservatism. And um, these parties are drawing on it, um, but that conservative political culture is bigger in, um, you know, in, in, in some of the East European countries, a little more vigorous in say Hungary, or you can convince more people of that in Hungary or Poland than you can in some West European countries because of historical fe features. And I think the other, the other thing that you point out is of course the liberal economic reforms, which are also much more substantial, right? So, um, you know, when we talk about family 500 plus, I, I talked about it as being revolutionary for Eastern Europe. It's a pretty traditional family policy program that's common to Netherlands and Denmark. I mean, they already have it. So um, to promise it wouldn't really, you know, win you as many votes, I suppose, right? Um, you know, so I, I think that the, the issue is that these are countries that were uh, developing, that, um, that uh, were subject to very, very tough economic policies that were much more painful for people than uh, anything that's been experienced in recent memory in Western Europe um, since the um, since the Second World War, honestly, right? I mean, the type of deprivation that people saw in East Europe um, after 1989 was incomparable to anything that happened in Western Europe since the Second World War. And so, you know, uh, and, and they were disappointed with these policies and uh, wanted to vote against them. And um, the populist uh, parties eventually figured out that they could win votes on that basis and get a whole new electorate who was unenthusiastic with the conservative agenda, but enthusiastic about having a better life for their families. And, um, and so unfortunately, you know, that's a hard combination to beat in Eastern Europe, right? Um, so the, 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 my view, and I think Boyan expressed this earlier, is that the left in Eastern Europe and Central and Eastern Europe or the liberals in Central, they're never going to out xenophobize, you know, out xenophobe the right. They're not, never gonna out Catholic the right. They're not, never gonna kind of, you know, out conservative the right. But they do have an opportunity to out um, compete the right in terms of their uh, liberal socioeconomic policies. And the tragedy I think of, of the politics in, in some of these countries is that the left does not want to go there because it so, remains so convinced of the liberal economic measures and the liberal economic policies um, that it is unwilling to compete uh, for votes based on generous um, economic policies or a recognition of the pain and suffering that was caused by neoliberal economic policies. So that's really the tragic uh, thing that's going on in this part of the world right now is that the, we think that the populist right is kind of winning this debate uh, kind of on the ground and that in a lot of ways, the liberals are not even really fighting the right battle. I mean, you can talk about democracy, you know, and democracy is great, but a lot of people are wondering, you know, when's democracy gonna put food on the table, right? And, um, and the fact is that democracy in this part of the world was consonant, democratization was consonant with food not being on the table with food leaving the table, with social security being uh, challenged. And so they're just less interested right now in uh, hearing these like highfalutin messages about how we need democracy and rule of law. You know, that's just the unfortunate reality. You can't have watched the politics of the last, you know, several years in Poland or Hungary without seeing that, right? Um, not that we would disagree that democracy is important, it's vitally important, but you know, in countries where democracy is meant you lose so much, um, people just don't want to really hear that anymore. They want to hear something different. Okay, thanks. It's a very clear message. It, um, it's a message that probably runs as much wider resonance than Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, we could think about it in relation to the United States today. And fortunately, it looks as if the, the Biden administration is not making that mistake. So that um, bread and democracy are going together rather than, uh, than apart. But that's really a, a different uh, discussion. But I think being able to compare uh, across 
uh, regions and polities uh, is really very stimulating. I hope we will be continuing to do this in our European politics in transition uh, series. So watch this space. And thanks so much to our great speakers, uh, Mitchell Ornstein, Boyan Bugaric, and Sarah Delaney. Uh, and good night. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you for the invitation. Pleasure.